the, the, the Bible reading today is from John chapter 6, verses 25 um, to 40. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God the Father, has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Good morning. I'm Tina, one of the readers here. Um, just before I start, uh, some of the church family know that I've had a few medical excitements recently, um, and I just want to say thank you, because probably for the first time in my life, I felt, whether it was the morphine or whatever it was, that I couldn't pray for myself. And knowing that the church family was holding me up in prayer was just the most wonderful blessing. So I want to say thank you. And I am here, so thank God for that. So, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here this morning. I ask you, please, Lord, to be in the words that I speak. Help us to hear those words, Lord, not only in our heads and take them into our minds, but help them to touch our hearts and our souls. Amen. Thank you. So yes, I'm beginning the series on the I Ams. So I got, I am the bread of life. So I just wanted to set it in the sort of timeline of Jesus's time on earth. So we start John 6. At the beginning of John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000 at Bethsaida, at the edge of the Sea of Galilee. He feeds them with those two loaves and fishes from the boys' lunch, 5,000 men, 
maybe more women and children. And then we're told in verse 15 that Jesus went off alone to the mountainside because he wanted to get away from the crowd because they wanted to make him king by force. So he leaves and he goes on his own. The disciples in the evening time take the one and only boat and set off across the Sea of Galilee, back to Capernaum, which has become their sort of home base. They're on the water, the wind gets up, as I'm told in books it does on the Sea of Galilee, the waves got higher and rougher, and just as they're beginning to fear, Jesus appears walking on the water. They're terrified, but he assures them, he reassures them, everything's fine, it's him. He gets in the boat, and almost instantly, they arrive at the shore. When, when I sum it up like that, and I know probably most and then he got in the boat and they immediately arrived at the shore and, you know, it's a bit like Amy said, we just take it for granted, don't we? We've read it before, we know it. It's, it's, it's story. It's Jesus' life. It's the wonderful things he did. But, you know, just sometimes, just think what, what I just said. So, okay. This is the next morning. Uh, some of the people that have been fed, some of the 5,000, go looking for Jesus. They knew there was only one boat. They knew Jesus didn't get into it. The disciples did. So they go looking for him. Can't find him. What's happened? Where is he? They want to find him. They want to see him, for whatever the motive. Some more boats appear, and somehow they purloin these boats by some method, and they set off to Capernaum, across the lake, to try and find him. And they get there. And this is where our reading started to go, that Amy read for us. So they find Jesus, and they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? You can imagine confusion. Maybe they should have said, how did you get here? But no, it was, hang on, what time? When did you get here, Lord? But he doesn't give them a straight answer, as often Jesus didn't, because he wanted to lead them on, didn't he? He wanted them to understand more. So he says to them, he knows why they've come. Not because of the amazing, miraculous signs, but actually because he fed them. And perhaps they were hungry again, and they wanted more bread. Jesus knew their motives as they stood around him again on that day. They wanted to satisfy their immediate needs. He tells them that every day they're going to need more bread to live, to sustain their physical bodies, and to keep them going, to keep them alive. But he says, no, no, I am the bread of life. Feed on me because I'm the bread that satisfies and sustains your spiritual lives now and on into eternal life. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to do any amazing works. They just had to believe and feed on him. So in a nutshell... That's it. I could sit down now. That's what the verses say. And you probably think, oh, good, early coffee. No, but, you know, I just want to take it a bit deeper because as I've been reading these words this week, it got me thinking about motives, why we do what we do. We know that when those came to Jesus, their motive was that they were hungry again and they wanted feeding. They wanted the immediate, not the eternal. But, but in truth, and, and this might be a bit controversial, because I think Jesus quite, sounded quite sharp with them in a way, but, you know, they were understandably confused, weren't they? For 400-odd years, they'd been told, by Malachi, I think was the last prophet, wasn't he? And they'd been told that a Messiah, a Saviour, was going to come. 
He was going to be their leader, their saviour. He was going to rescue them. He was going to usher in this golden age of peace and security and wonder. Well, maybe this is the one. Moses had pro promised a prophet just like him. Somebody who'd feed them and care for them. He'd just fed them on that hillside, 5,000 of them. Surely, surely, this is the one. We're told that they tried to make him a king. They were just confused, but naturally confused. They'd sat at their father's knee, hearing the promise of the one to come. The one that would get rid of the Roman invaders, the ones that would save them. He was going to do it. No wonder, no wonder they came to him and they were confused about what he was going to do. It was the immediate. It wasn't the eternal they were looking for. When they mentioned Moses and the manna in the desert, of course Moses rescued the, the wonderful family of the Jews from slavery in Egypt. He led them through that desert for 40 years. He fed them, they said, manna from heaven. Jesus has to remind them that actually the manna from heaven came from God, not from Moses. It seemed a bit much, didn't it, when they asked for another miracle, please? Can we have another sign then? To us, it thinks, oh, stop, he's just fed 5,000, he's walked on the water. You know, what more do you want? But hey-ho, Moses fed them for 40 years. What's another one, please, Jesus? If you're in the you know, same family, the same line as Moses, let's have some more bread, please. They were confused. Yes, they were confused, men. Jesus reminded them that Moses, Moses had said, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus is that word. So back to the men. Yes, of course, they were confused. They, they didn't know who he was, what sort of a prophet he was. Was he the one to save them right now? They just didn't know. And their motives were wrong. But at least they went looking. They made that first step. They crossed the lake. They got in that boat and they went looking. And that's why, in a way, I sort of feel, well, thank goodness they did. Because what if they hadn't have crossed the lake to go looking? They wouldn't have found out any more. They wouldn't have been able to go take the next steps. We don't know how many of these took the next steps on their faith journey. But at least now they knew more. They knew Jesus was the bread of life that would feed them spiritually and give them that peace of his now and eternal life forever. It made me think about my motives when I became a Christian. I think sometimes it's, it's quite good to think, to do a bit of soul searching. Why? Why did I take that first step? I have to admit, you know, confession time, more confession time. Um, I was in a place in Birmingham where it was the socially accepted thing to do to be confirmed. I had no faith at all. I was 13 and a half. I was going around with this group at church. Um, they were all getting confirmed. I thought it was a nice idea. Um, and anyway, one of the boys was quite good looking. And um, so I went. And I remember the minister saying to me, Tina, why do you want to believe in God? Nobody had ever asked me that before. And I said, well, no, at, at that age, you don't temper what you say, do you? It just goes bleh. And I said, fear. And he looked at me and he said, why? What, what are you afraid of? He said, well, I, I said, well, I've been told there's heaven or hell. I don't fancy hell, so I want heaven, please. So I'm afraid. I want to believe in Jesus. And that's where I began. Now, okay, my motives were wrong, but at least I began. 
It took me till I was 29 to give my life to Jesus, but I began. I took those first steps. There was a lot of darkness in between 14 and 29, but I got there. Jesus got me. I got Jesus. How wonderful was that? Because I began to believe that I believed in Jesus for not what he could do for me in the future, but for what he'd done for me in the past. I believed in him. So sometimes, and I've had a bit of time recently, obviously, not being my usual frantic self, to think about motives. Where did I begin and where am I now? Those men, yes, wrong motives, but they took a step. They learnt more. They were on the journey. And who knows where they led, where that journey led their lives. We don't know. So what about us? Where did we start? Why did we become Christians? Why did we start looking for God? Was it because we were part of a Christian family and it was expected? Was it that our mates were getting confirmed, going to church, so we went along? Whatever it was, we started. And then the journey began. And Jesus can lead us on. Where are we now on our journey? Whoa, biggie. How many times do we fall backwards instead of going forward? But Jesus picks us up and leads us on. It's good to do some soul searching. It's funny what I am the bread of life did for me this week. Last thing. When I was reading um, the bit about Moses again and the feeding of the Jewish people in the desert, it made me remember that at the end of their 40 years of walking round and round in circles, basically, eating manna, they got to that edge. They got to the line with Joshua between their old lives and their new lives in the Promised Land. It had been 40 years where God had never left them, but they were confused, they were lost, they challenged, they doubted, they did the wrong things, they messed up many times. God never left them, and they got to the edge of the promised land with Joshua to lead them across. And forgive me, you might think, you know, perhaps it's still the drugs, but I, I sort of thought about me and us, because in a way, don't we stand on the edge? We've only had 18 months. It's felt like 40 years at times, right? But we've had 18 months where it's been confusing. We've been fearful. Maybe some of us have had doubts. It's been dark. It's been a grieving time. There's been so much change. God has never left us, and through fantastic technology and will and people who can work out the technology, we've been able to be together in a way, yes. But it's been a hard time. And now we stand, I think, just like that family of God, on the line between past and future. We can't do away with the past. The past makes us what we are but we stand on that line. It's quite a scary place to be. But today it started. We've got children downstairs being together and the great joy that is. But what's our future going to look like? If God isn't at the center of it, then we're lost. Our future, well, who knows? What are our priorities? How are we going to step across that line? We need to feed, believe, take Jesus into our hearts and souls and ask him to lead us on. Joshua, in Joshua 29, he says to his people that they've got to choose They've got to choose between their old gods 
or taking on the true God before they can go forward into the promised land together. Now, you know, I don't think there's probably many of us here who worship old gods, as in idols or anything else, but maybe there are a few gods in our lives, if we're honest, that distract us, that take our time, that stop us focusing on Jesus. Do we need to put them down? Individually and as a church, perhaps we do. Perhaps we have to ask God to point out those things that get in the way. But what I want for all of us is if you remember what Joshua said at the end. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen.